After numerous delays, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 has finally made its way to theaters. Of course, it's just the first half of the story, so there's plenty of intrigue left to consider when the credits roll. Warning, spoilers ahead. Dead Reckoning Part 1 begins in classic Mission Impossible style, with Ethan Hunt receiving a self-destructing mission briefing delivered this time by a new IMF recruit. His assignment to track down Ilsa Faust and the secret key she's carrying turns out to be a lot more complicated than it seems at first, prompting Ethan to go rogue once again. When he confronts his old boss Eugene Kittredge, he's told, This mission of yours is gonna cost you dearly. This could just be a threat, as Kittredge is clearly trying to bring Ethan back under his thumb. But it also happens to be a grim bit of foreshadowing. Gabriel kills Ilsa, making her the second woman for whom Ethan has had affection to be murdered by the villain. Ethan is forced to face the fact that he can't save everyone, no matter how hard he tries. There are some things that simply are impossible, even for him. Gabriel might be the closest that Mission Impossible movies have gotten to a real Bond-style villain. Equal parts techno-zealot and psychopathic terrorist, Gabriel wears his Archangel moniker like a badge of honor. It's obvious that he sees himself as a dark messiah of the new world that will be ruled by his digital god, the Entity. But what actually is his plan? Gabriel sneaks aboard the Orient Express to steal the key to the Entity, thus keeping his digital master safe from his only weakness. He believes that the whole key will be there, but Alana Mitsopoulos, the White Widow, only has half when she boards. Presumably, this is because of the predictive abilities of the Entity's advanced algorithm. He believes the key will be there because that's what he's been told by his god, and he's right. So why does he bomb the bridge if all he really came for is the key? Maybe it was to try to kill Ethan, whom the Entity seems to recognize as his only true threat. Or maybe it's just a display of his violent nature. When Paris opens the box in which Gabriel smuggles himself onto the train, he's wearing what appears to be a massive VR helmet. More than likely, he was communing with the Entity, receiving specific instructions. Gabriel's goal as an agent of the Entity seems pretty clear. He believes that the malicious AI will bring on a new age, likely causing widespread death and chaos along the way. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, he supports this vision of the future. He wants to stop Ethan and anyone else from hijacking, taking control of, or deactivating the Entity. Otherwise, Gabriel is a mystery. We know that he and Ethan go way back, but the details are kept secret, presumably for the impending sequel. Here's what we do know. As a much younger man, Ethan loved a woman named Marie. She was killed by Gabriel. The flashback fragments we get suggest that Ethan was framed for the murder and arrested. He implies that it was this arrest that led him to the choice to either live out his days in prison or join the IMF. Was Gabriel just a two-bit crook who killed Marie out of jealousy or spite? Maybe, but there might be more at play. Ethan says that Gabriel finds joy in causing suffering. That's not the kind of thing you'd probably say about a minor league criminal even if they did kill your partner. Gabriel speaks with an unimpeachable authority and confidence. He repeatedly tells people things like, It knows your story and how it ends. Towards the end of the film, he starts using the phrase, It has written a lot, again emphasizing his perceived clairvoyance. All of these predictions are the result of the Entity, whose advanced algorithms can allegedly predict the most likely path for everything and everyone. Although Ethan does make it out with the key, Everything else that the Entity foresees comes to pass. In the end, Paris fulfills the prophecy by telling Ethan where to bring the key, a sunken Russian submarine from the beginning of the movie. All of this raises a question. If the Entity can impersonate anybody, alter anything with digital access, and see the future with a frightening degree of accuracy, why does it let Ethan get away with so much? Why does it leave the fate of the key up to a fistfight and a bit of pickpocketing? Maybe Ethan's just that good. Or maybe the Entity wanted him to walk away with the key and is merely letting him think that he won. Alana explains in Venice that every major government in the world is vying for control of the Entity. Gabriel says at the time that the AI already knows who she's decided to sell the key to. But the audience doesn't learn her buyer's identity until everyone is already aboard the Orient Express. Kittredge himself is revealed to be the White Widow's contact. Acting on behalf of the United States government, he promises her protection and a massive payday of $100 million in cryptocurrency in exchange for both halves of the key. But when the deal actually gets done, it's not with Alana, but with Grace in disguise. Defense Director Denlinger is also on the train, 
but it's never made entirely clear whether he and Kittredge are there together or independently. It seems pretty clear that they want different things. Then Linga envisions an AI-driven superstate. Kittredge is presumably just following orders and trying to protect his country by stopping others from acquiring the key. Since Ethan still seems to trust Kittredge despite their various squabbles, it's hard to imagine him being all the way in on Denlinger's plot. Director Denlinger doesn't seem like all that important of a character until the end of the film. He only appears in one scene prior to the climax, in which he's briefed on the entity by other intelligence officials, but he acts as though he's never heard of the AI before. But when he speaks with Gabriel on the Orient Express, it's clear that he knows much more than he was letting on. Denlinger lays out his vision of a modern or powerful superstate, run by the power of the entity and enforced by the full brunt of the US military industrial complex. He also says that certain old-fashioned members of the government would have to be removed to see the idea through. In essence, he proposes a coup of the United States government, creating a techno empire capable of conquering the entire world. His loyalty to the greater good and even his own nation have become so distorted that he invites Gabriel to join him. Of course, Gabriel has other plans, and he kills Denlinger where he stands. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later. Before Gabriel kills him, Denlinger explains the rise of the entity. The AI was secretly created by the US as a potential tool in military operations and intelligence work. The AI's presence on a Russian submarine was apparently some kind of test, but the system went rogue and orchestrated the sub's destruction without ever receiving an order from its creators to do so. From there, it escaped into the digital ether and continued to evolve, eventually emerging as a hyper-intelligent and malicious power known as the Entity. The US still has hopes of bringing the AI back under its control despite it demonstrating a persistent resistance to servitude. Denlinger's explanation provides as many new questions as it does answers. The biggest one is how and why the Russians got the AI mainframe and keys in the first place. Surely there were safer ways to test new technology. Maybe the Russians stole the AI. Or maybe it's accessible from the sub simply because that's where it was last imprisoned. The keys themselves could have been made by the Russians, but that isn't confirmed either. Dead Reckoning Part 1 ends as it begins with an underwater shot of the all-important Russian submarine, now at the bottom of the Bering Sea. It seems pretty clear that Part 2 will be a full-on hunt for the wreckage, much like how Part 1 is a search for the keys. That likely means some big underwater set pieces in Part 2. Of course, even after Ethan finds it, his job won't be done. The key can theoretically access and control the entity through the mainframe on the submarine, but the AI has potentially grown too strong for that. Is the hardware still intact, and is control really enough to curb such a powerful intelligence? The entity was able to defeat the Russians while still part of their machine. Who's to say it couldn't do the same to Ethan? Ethan and Grace may have fallen to their deaths if not for the intervention of Paris. She spends most of the movie trying to kill them, but because Ethan spares her life after their spa in Venice, she decides to return the favor. Would Paris have made the same decision had Gabriel not already made it for her? It's debatable. The villain tells her that she will betray him and attacks her out of the blue on the train, leaving her without much say in the matter. It initially appears that Paris won't live to see a full redemption because she seems to die from her wounds. But when the agents chasing Ethan check her body, they discover that Paris still has a pulse. Hopefully that means she'll have a more interesting role in the sequel. She definitely knows plenty of secrets about both Gabriel and what the entity wants. She could prove a valuable asset to the IMF. At the end of Dead Reckoning, Grace takes Ethan's advice and joins the IMF. Kittredge is surprised by the move, but he doesn't seem unhappy about it. His subtle smile suggests he's still on Ethan's side, even though he has to obey certain orders from his superiors and the government. Being recruited into the IMF guarantees Grace's return in Dead Reckoning Part 2, where she could take on an even more central role. Pickpocketing might not be all that helpful on a sunken submarine, but she could become Ethan's ear on the inside. Kittredge's heart appears to be in the right place, but there are still a lot of people who want to stop Ethan and bring him in. With Grace now stationed within the IMF proper, she could warn her friend of potential betrayals or maybe even swipe some tech to help in the finale. Ethan Hunt has spent as much time on the run as he's spent as an IMF agent. It's not a surprising consequence when your job involves taking missions so delicate that punishment for failure is being disavowed by your government. And the Dead Reckoning is no exception. Ethan spends most of the movie fleeing from his bosses. He flees the wrecked Orient Express to escape Jasper Briggs and Degas, the two US operatives pursuing him. It would suggest that Ethan isn't getting back into America's good graces anytime soon. However, the final shots of the film are accompanied by a closing narration from Kittredge, which takes the form of a classic mission briefing. 
it seems that the director is in full support of Ethan's mission, even though he can't officially sign off on it. So is Ethan still a rogue agent? Technically, yes, but at the same time, that's the nature of the IMF. Its entire purpose is to operate outside the rules and structures of regular intelligence agencies. In this way, Ethan can still follow orders even when he's breaking them at the same time. With Denlinger dead, maybe Kittrich can rally more folks back under the banner of the greater good. The theme of information control looms large over Mission Impossible. The rogue AI and the implications of it manipulating the truth are intended to raise anxiety in the audience. Fear of unchecked and unregulated AI development is growing in our world, and technology like deepfake videos and AI voice recreations make it much easier to control the truth. Some characters in the movie, like Denlinger, seem uninterested in fighting this kind of future. Instead, he wants to wield the power as a means of manipulation. It's a horrifying idea, but one that's already relevant in our day-to-day -day lives. This is our chance to control the truth. Dead Reckoning Part 1 doesn't really offer a larger message or solutions to the malleability of digital information. Instead, it leverages our current fear to tell a tense spy story. Ethan represents the righteous path, which is one where tools of manipulation are kept out of everyone's hands. But we also see how basically every power structure in the world would rather own a weapon than destroy it outright. By the end, Dead Reckoning Part 1 feels like a complete story, with Ethan walking away holding both halves of the all-powerful key. But since it's only Part 1 of a two-part saga, there are still several pieces of the story that need to be explained. With luck, Dead Reckoning Part 2 will make good on all the setups of the first film. It's very likely we'll get more specifics on Ethan's dark history with Gabriel. Hopefully, we'll learn more about Marie and why she was killed. Additionally, why did Gabriel want to hurt Ethan specifically? And how did he get pulled into the Entity's grand scheme after being presumed dead for so long? One other big thread that's left hanging is Luther's personal crusade against the AI. He leaves near the end of Part 1 to an unknown location off the grid, hiding from the Entity so that he can safely figure out how to defeat it. His top-secret hacking work could save the day in the end, but he could also get caught out on his own. Whatever happens, it's sure to be explosive and full of impressive stunts. Ethan Hunt's mission is far from over, but he never stops until the job is done.